Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. And when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Wherever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, yea, he gave good heed, and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished, of making of many books there is no end, and of much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Dear God, you know I've prepared. You know how I've studied. You know the words the people here need to hear. Take me out of the way, Lord, and give them exactly what they need. And I'll give you all the praise and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the study of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 here, I'm going to give it the title, Fear and Love Thy Creator. Fear and Love Thy Creator. And again, true to the preacher's mode, he gives this sound advice again. Remember now thy Creator. Remember now thy Creator. Knowing again that this life is vain, which we have walked through and heard time and time again from the preacher, he would deal with the topic... And then he would say, vanity of vanities. Just, just illustrating the fact that as we live this life, no matter what we do, in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to things eternal, it is vain. The only way that we can ever achieve something that is not vain is to work in that which is eternal, lay up treasures where moth and rust doth not corrupt, and that is best done with the saving of souls. The best thing... And the most, uh, the most um, fruitful thing and what is of most value to bring into this next life is a soul for the Lord Jesus. So this life as it is vain, it is also though in fact the life here that we live that allows us to earn rewards. And God willing we would also strengthen and instill good values in the next generation. So we can earn rewards for eternity. We can also build generations based on the principles and the example that we live here today. Throughout the preaching of Ecclesiastes, which is primarily a book that Solomon wrote to his son in order to give him some sound advice as he was coming up after him and about to take over the kingdom, in his wise old age, he wrote this book reflecting back upon the many things that he had learned in the time that he was here. Yea, and all his vanity eventually he gave us and, and, and alluded to, but very forcefully actually pushed forward the fact that it is all vain in the end. Solomon also filled this book with very sound advice. He talked about giving. And how it applies to the believer's life. He talked about maintaining a right and good testimony. He talked about taking advantage of this life and living it to the fullest. 
He talked about authority and our obedience unto it. He talked about wisdom and how it, how it grows and strengthens those that are wise. He talked about the different priorities given to things that are, are deemed better things. And in general, he just talked about life on this earth, life in this world, and how to live it, how to be wise in this life. So I remember hearing many warnings as I, as I grew up as a Christian about taking too much doctrine from Ecclesiastes. And I think part of the warning comes from those first pages. And I learned to it when I, when I first cracked this book uh, many weeks back, where he, where he says, the words of the preacher, and that's how the very book starts, the words of the preacher. It doesn't say the words of God. It doesn't say, thus saith the Lord, as so many other passages of Scripture do. It says, the words of the preacher. And I think because of that, a lot of people get the idea that maybe these words are a little bit biased with Solomon's personal opinion. But no, I believe that as we've read, we've also learned, all of the principles that Solomon gives are, are, just, are just ripe with the wisdom of God. So the words of the preacher then are holy anointed words. And as he laid them down, there are things that are profitable unto us for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, for correction. They're, they're profitable unto us as any scripture is profitable to us. And not just words of men, but the very words of of God. Yes, a man who was a king who was deemed wisest in the earth, giving instruction unto another man, his son, at the surface. But so much more as the Spirit of God empowered him to move his pen and put the Spirit of God's own words upon the paper, which I believe is what we are beholding today. And in general, like I said, we can take from these very words and learn many things about life and godliness. We can learn things about what it means to live life on this world. Though it is vain, we can gender great things to apply to our lives and grow thereby. Are these just the words of the preacher? Is there things in here that are questionable and that we need to take a second look at? I didn't see it. I didn't see anything that the, the book of Saul, the Ecclesiastes recorded that seemed to be the wisdom of man inserted in there. No, I saw something that was from the perspective of a man living upon earth. So he would say things like man goeth to his long home. He would say things like man falls to the dust and it is not but in the context of everything he's talking about a spiritual man living in a very unspiritual world a vain world an empty world a fruitless world and how he is to navigate these things and that's what i learned about throughout this are they just the words of a preacher no they're the very words of god so here again he's reminding us of a very simple and practical truth here again he says a statement like this that just cuts to the core, though it is very simple in its presentation. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. And as I think back upon my own life, oh, that I would have known of the creator in the days of my youth. But how much more young children that know of the creator in the days of your youth. And you have the opportunity to remember him as you walk through this life. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Oh, that I would have known him. Oh, that I would have been given a godly heritage. Oh, that I would have been brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. No, I was in a disadvantage because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And I can't remember my creator in the days of my youth. But here, he's talking to just as much the youth. He's also talking to every one of us. Because I made that statement, and it still rings true. That today is your youth of tomorrow. Today you are the youngest you will ever be. So the same charges to you, oh man. The same charges to you, oh woman. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. You're younger today than you will be tomorrow. And tomorrow you better look back and remember your creator. If you've been saved by the blood of the crucified one, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Remember the God that bought you. Bring him to remembrance. And this is the charge that's being given here. Remember him. Bring him to remembrance. And he says this, while the evil days come not. While the evil days come not. And he begins to expound, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in in them. So here he says, remember your creator now in the days of your youth. 
while the evil days have not come. And the interesting about the next portion that I'm going to read, if anybody is, is learned in, in end times prophecy, is that the preacher here begins to give different types of end times events from his perspective. And it's interesting because he's saying, hey, remember your creator now. And what did he just tell us? In a vain and wicked and foolish and carnal world, here are principles that we can live by regarding giving, regarding maintaining our testimony, regarding living life to the fullest, regarding authority and serving and obedience under it, regarding wisdom and how it grows somebody, regarding the priorities that you give to better things, time management, right? Regarding all these things, this is how you need to live in this world while the evil days come not. Nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day while the keepers of the houses shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors be shut in the streets, when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshoppers be a burden, and desire shall fail. Because man goeth unto his long home, and the mourners go about in the streets, or ever the silver cord be loosened, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto the God who gave it. Here he gives that, that finality to the picture of what's being described. That vain world is coming to a climactic and final end. There is a spirit that was given that is going to return unto the God that gave it. There is a silver cord that is going to be loosed. There is a golden bowl that's going to be broken. There is a pitcher broken at the fountain. There is a wheel that's broken at the cistern. And as men die, and as men fall, and as men fail, goeth to their long home, and the mourners walk about in the streets just knowing that their time is next. He's painting this picture of the climax of all things. And in the end, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with the secret thing, whether it be good or whether it evil. So remember your creator. Why? Because he's going to bring all the things that you're doing now into the judgment. You will stand before in judgment. If you are a saved person, it will be Christ throne where you would stand before and judge for your works, whether they were works that had eternal consequence or whether they were works that had no significance. If you're not saved today, your works will be judged and you will be cast forever into the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, because none of us will stand before a holy God with any of our sins speckling our bodies. And so when he presents this, he's given it from the context of what I believe He's, he's basically taking his son in the time that he lived and stretching out history far beyond even where we stand today, saying that, hey, there is a winding down happening. Hey, there is a finality to this vain life. Recognize that, yes, you yourself may die tomorrow by natural causes, by accidents, by, by who knows what, some sort of disease, some sort of sickness. But all of this in general, all the things that I spent my whole life trying to figure out, that I, that I dug deep and tried to, tried to find out different, different ways of wisdom and different things to understand how the world works. And in the context, if you go back into Ecclesiastes or listen to the previous preaching, you'll see Solomon spent many days trying to discover natural th things, trying to discover the ways of man and how they intermingle with the world. He tried to discover all sorts of things. In the end, it says it's all vanity. And this is a reminder that and whether you live five years from now or 50 years from now, it's all coming to an end. There's a finality unto the things that we're talking about yet. While the evil days come not, here's some of the things that Solomon points out. He says, he says the sun and moon in the end in those evil days will be darkened. He said there's strong men going to bow themselves. He says the grinders are going to cease because they are few. And he's saying there's going to be grasshoppers that are a burden. And he said man is going unto his long home. Mourners are going about in the streets, and eventually the dust shall return to the earth, even as we were made of the dust, and the spirit shall return unto the God that gave it, and he will then do what? Separate the sheep from the goats. 
right? He's just gonna he's just gonna do his his dividing, separating. So I'm to everlasting life and joy, so I'm to everlasting torments and contempt, depending on what they have done with the Son of God. Amen. But this is an interesting thing, like I said, because uh, too often we think that some of the doctrines that we believe specifically about the end times do not apply to the Old Testament, that they just had no understanding or comprehension of these things. But we find very real prophetic language captured in only a few verses of Solomon. He was given a window to understand specific truths that were revealed to us later by the teachings of Jesus and revealed to us later by the revelation of Jesus Christ himself through the prophet John. And it's interesting to note that and to grab a hold of that. So I just want to outline, and as you read, you're going to see some of these passages. Turn to Matthew 24 and turn to Revelation 6. We're going to be in those two places. Matthew 4 and Revelation 6. The words of the wiser is goads and his nails fastened by the master of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. So these wise words come from the one shepherd. And he gave them to Solomon to record them here as just a picture of the whole, of the climax and the finality of mankind in order to draw spiritual truths unto his attended audience, which was the king. By extension was not only the king of Israel, but also the kingdom that he was over. So if you will, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And I'll never forget the first time that I did this with my wife. She asked me about, about the timings of certain things in the, old, in the, uh, the final days. And uh, I hadn't prepared it. I hadn't thought of it. But I just said, hey, well, what if I just go to the Bible in the two places that I believe discuss that topic and just compare them scripture with scripture? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine such a, a crazy thought as to compare Bible with Bible and see what the Bible says. We don't need commentaries today. The New Testament is the commentary of the Old. This is why I'm saying we can look at a passage from Ecclesiastes and it seems very vague and ambiguous. Well, it would have been even harder for them to comprehend because they didn't have Matthew and they definitely didn't have Revelation, but we have Matthew 24. We have Revelation chapter 6. And as we read it, we're going to find the sun and moon being darkened. We're going to find strong men bowing themselves. We're going to find grinders, that exact term, grinders, ceasing. And we're going to find the burden of the locust that is causing great pain and torments upon this earth. So here we go. Start with me in Revelation chapter 24. Revelation chapter 24. Again, I'm just doing this. I'm just holding my page like that. Sorry, Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. I'm just holding my page like that in those two portions. Just going to go back and forth here. I just have notes. The first time I did this was rather impromptu with my wife. But the interesting thing about last day's topics is that when I first read what I'm going to read here, I took it at face value. It only takes one time reading through the scriptures to get it at face value. You've got the Holy Spirit of God living in you. And with my wife, it only took one reading through the scriptures for her to understand these things and to go, yeah, I agree with that. Why? Because it was Bible. It takes rather, though, a whole generation upon generation of preaching to the opposite of what's determined here in order to teach you wrongly about it. It takes, it takes days, weeks, months. It, it takes great time to brainwash somebody into not believing the plain truths of the scripture. But Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 match up perfectly, and I'm going to show you. Matthew 24, I'm going to get probably twisted up. You can, you can let me know, any of you men, if I get Matthew and Revelation backwards or I start saying the wrong numbers. Um, <clears throat> but again, when I first did this, it wasn't in, in any kind of pretense of knowing exactly what to do. I just simply read the Bible, and uh, I didn't have an outline, and I, and, and I barely have one now. So here we go. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came unto him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, and there's two things they're asking, three things, When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Now Jesus is all about truth, right? He's all about giving up. He's the word. He's the very words of God. So you think at this time, Jesus is going to start to give them some sort of hidden or veiled truth. Now I believe that when they answer those questions and those three questions, he's going to give them the answer. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you, 
For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Turn to Revelation 6. False Christ is what it's talking about. Revelation 6 and verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, the Bible records that's Jesus, opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Now the thing that we need to understand is that these beasts are angelic creatures. The Apostle John, he was out on the Isle of Patmos where he received these revelations. And they must have been indeed very strange unto him as he started to see some sort of things. But what we really need to focus in on is not all of the different types of beasts and the creatures and what they might be, but the plain words I think will grab us and reveal unto us the truths about things that we're revealing and, and learning about and studying in other portions of scriptures. So don't get bogged down in the idea of the beast, is what I'm saying. But they're saying unto him, come and see. And I saw, verse 2, and behold, a white horse, and he that, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So here the white horse that comes forward has a bow, a crown, in other words, a, 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 a signification of authority, of reigning, was given unto him. And as he goes, he conquers, and he goes to conquer. And that's what you see there in Matthew chapter 24. Many false Christs shall come, and shall deceive many. Continue reading in Revelation 6 and verse 3. The Bible says, and when he had opened the second seal, remember this is Jesus opening seals, this is Jesus allowing these things to come to pass, I heard, he's not necessarily causing them, but he's allowing them to come to pass by opening the seal, right? The seal that would stop that from breaking forward, right? When I, when I have a pitcher of water here, it's like this, and it's sealed, right? It's sealed, and when I open the seal, it comes forth, right? It just, he's letting it go, that's all he's doing. <clears throat> So in Matthew chapter 24, we'll get there. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 6 and verse 3. He said, come and see. Verse 4, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So here, peace is removed from the world. Peace is removed from from the world. Go back to Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So when peace is removed, what is that? War, right? You remove peace and there is war. Peace and war are the opposite. So in Revelation, though it's a different way of explaining it, that peace would be removed by this red horseman. In Matthew chapter 24, the same thing's happening. Peace is being removed. Therefore, wars and rumors of wars are entering in. And here the charge is given to the disciples very specifically. Don't be troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The end is not here yet, but these things must come to pass. Don't be troubled. You see them coming. Don't be troubled. The end is not yet. He continues on. Verse 7, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and verse 7 says, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Go to Revelation now. Go to Revelation. You'll see in verse 5. Revelation 6 and verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see that hurt not the oil and the wine. So here we have the black horse with the balances. And he's crying out a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. Well, what in the world, Brother Josh, does that have to do with what we just read in Matthew chapter 24? Well, think about it. Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom will rise against kingdom. Do you remember what it was like when we went to World War I, we went to World War II? Do you remember what it was like for the ones that dwelt here? There was extreme famine. The rich were getting rich, the poor were getting poor, and there was great famine because they were sending all of their reserves and all their supplies to the front line. But add to this 
On top of it, on top of the wars that are having in the kingdom rising against kingdom, you have famines, you have pestilences, you have earthquakes in diverse places. All of these things are resulting in a shortage of what people need on a day-to-day -day basis. Famines, pestilences, earthquakes, there's sickness, there's disease, there's earthquakes limiting people's ability to retain and to get some things. And now you can see the truth of verse 6 from Revelation chapter 6 where it says a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. A penny in the Bible times was a day's wage. So you're going to buy a measure of wheat for a penny, you're going to add some water to it, and you're going to get a little bit of cakes. Right? I love the little bit of cakes that we have over here, but if you had to sustain yourself on that and live all, and work a whole day in order to achieve it, that's sore famine. That is peril. It continues, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So here, a fourth part of the earth, one quarter of the earth is killed by sword. It's killed by hunger. It's killed by death. It's killed by the beasts of the earth, and it's all by that pale horse whose name is death and hell followed with him. Here, if you would go back to Matthew chapter 24, you'll read in verse 9. There was death, there was persecution, and all at the hands of this, this death and hell creature, this pale horse that goes and kills one quarter, one fourth part of it. Now if we go back to Matthew 24, as I said, in verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many because the and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Not salvation of the spirit, but you see, flesh is brought into the context here. Because if you were to look at Matthew 24 and flip over to page 20 or chapter verse 22, it says, No flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days should be short. Again, don't lose the context here. He that endureth unto the end, the, the same shall be sh saved from what? From the false prophets. From what? The love of many waxing cold. From what? The, uh, the killing, the, the hatred, all that's going on here, which is all associated with, I believe, that pale horse that is killing with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, if this creature has power over the earth at this time to do as he will with one quarter of the earth, you can see how a certain group is being pulled out here, is being singled out here. The one quarter of the earth perhaps is entirely encapsulated by the people that we see in Matthew chapter 24. It's the you that are afflicted. It's the you that are killed. It's the you that are hated, is what he's referring to here. And specifically, it was disciples that came and asked the question. So specifically, it's the disciples that are receiving the response. And this thing intensifies. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14 continues. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And uh, in Mark chapter 13, it says, What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. So who's reading this right now? I'm reading this right now. So if you're reading this, let him understand. Then let him with them which be in the in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down or take anything out of the house. Neither let him that which is in the field return back to take his clothes and warn to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time nor ever shall be. And I believe that the pale horse that is bringing death and hell following with him is the same that is persecuting and trying those 
that he is talking about specifically in the context of Matthew chapter 24. And this continues and it intensifies. And he says to those that are in Judea at the time, which is where the abomination will be, because it's going to be placed in the holy place, and it's going to be said of that holy place that they need to stand before it and they need to worship those things. Then those that are in Judea flee. Then those that are in the housetop, don't worry about your things. Get out of there. Don't return back to your house. Woe unto you if you're with child. It's saying that all of these things that are coming to pass, the great persecution, the great struggle, and as it says in verse 21, great tribulation are such that those that are in that area will be succumbed by it. But, verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall so and sh ugh, and shall so and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, or the truly elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For whithersoever the carcass, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. So here we see the continued warning unto those that are living at this time, the continued challenge to those that are living this time that there will be lies, there will be deceptions, there will be persecutions, there will be great tribulation coming upon those, even false Christ riding up and rising up and spearheading the very persecution. But I love that promise that for the elect's sake, the days will be shortened, and the elect, the very elect, shall not be deceived by these very things. And one of the greatest reasons that I know that they won't be deceived, or the greatest vehicles whereby they won't be deceived, is that the elect, those that are saved, those that are blood-bought children of the king, will heed verse 25, Behold, I have told you before. They would have already heard these things. Even as the disciples asked to know these things, we now are beholding these things plainly in the scriptures, and we have been told told before and therefore if you have read these things if you have received these things at the appointed time the spirit of truth will bring these things into remembrance for that's his very ministry to take the words of Christ and call them to my remembrance go back to Revelation chapter 6 and in verse 9 the Bible says and when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for yet a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren that should be killed as they were, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So even in heaven there is now this picture. And that's how we know that in the context of Revelation chapter 6, and given how it kicks off with um, false prophets, with wars and rumors of wars, with pestilence, with death entering in. And even as we can connect these dots, we can see how Revelation chapter 6 enlightens Matthew chapter 24 and reveals to us that the ones that are slain, that the ones that are, are, are ye, 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 according to the scriptures in Matthew chapter 24, are the very ones who are crying out to God saying, how long until you will judge? How long until you will condemn? How long until you will rise up against those that are persecuting us? And this all sets the stage for what's about to happen next. We have then, like I said, the, the opening, right? Just, just simply de-sealing what's happening. The vials are coming open. The, sorry, the, uh, um, the seals are being opened and what's being poured out is, is happening. And... Uh, and as it does, we see it's, it's very focused on things that are of this world. And the persecution is very real, and the persecution is specifically directed at a core group of people, which Revelation, or chapter 6, also alludes to when it says one quarter of the earth is going to receive the attacks, is going to receive the death, is going to receive the persecution and the struggles. 
But all that sets up to this point. If you go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29, we say here, again, we saw Christians in heaven. We saw them that were suffering. We saw them that, that there's going to be more as, as they prayed unto God for judgment. He says there needs to be a fulfillment of those that were with you, that they would suffer the same things, that they would also be killed in that same fashion. And all this leads up to verse 29 where it says, immediately after... Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So everything previous is called tribulation then, right? If he's now in the context of the scripture saying immediately after the tribulation, he's referring to what's ever before as the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened? Remember reading about that in Ecclesiastes? Shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then, when? After the tribulation. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a sound of a trumpet, and they shall, the angels shall, gather together his elect, the believers, from the four winds and from one end of heaven unto the other. So then we see a gathering happens at this point, which is immediately after the tribulation, and that gathering is kicked off by the sun and moon being darkened. Is, am, I, am I mixing the scriptures up here? Now I'm reading it plainly. We just read about this tribulation, which again applies directly and very clearly with Revelation chapter 6, with not imagination taking hold of it, but we see what happens previous, Matthew chapter 28, is considered tribulation by verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation, and what happens immediately after the tribulation? Sun and moon being darkened, moon not giving her light, stars of heaven are shaken, all of that happens. Then after the tribulation, after the sun and moon are darkened, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And then at that point only, after the tribulation, after the signs, after the Son of Man comes, the, the tribes of the earth mourn, then shall they gather together his elect from the four winds from one head of heaven unto the other. The common term used for that event is the rapture. And we see the position of that, the gathering together, would probably be a more biblical reason for it. But the rapture kind of identifies, at least in the context where we live now, the rapture is that gathering together of the elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven unto the other. And this is happening, again, I'm not mixing scripture, I'm not mingling this up, I'm not trying to twist it, I'm just presenting. There was a tribulation, 28 before. And now after the tribulation, sun and moon darkens, sun of man is appearing, the gathering together of the elect comes by way of the angels that are sent by the son of man who is in heaven. And as we read this, we see, let's go back, Revelation chapter 6, we should also see the same thing, should we not? Should we also see that these events unfold themselves then there is this great tribulation that escalates into a great uh, spike, a great peak of death happening upon a particular group of people. A great tribulation, if you will. We should see then, after that happening, there's a gathering. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. I'm not making this up. This is the Bible. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. And I beheld, and when he had opened, what? The sixth seal. And lo, there was an earthquake, and what? The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her own tongue figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Let's just look at that. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. Go back, you can see in Matthew chapter 24. What happened immediately after tribulation? In verse 29, the sun was darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars were shaken and fell. Back in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12, what happened? There was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, the moon as blood. The stars fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of the place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the caves and said unto the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. 
And who shall be able to stand? The great day of his wrath here at the climax of all this scenario, given at the sixth seal, is that the men, the chief captains, the rulers, the mighty, the free, the bond, everybody cries out and say, his day of wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? His day of wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? And back, at, back in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew, you read that in verse 30 where it said, nope. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where are the men? Where are the men? I lost them. Which man are you The great men hiding the bondman, the free man, the rich man, the chief man. Tribes of the earth mourn. Verse 30, I have it. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see. So here what was described in Matthew 24 is all the tribes of the earth mourning. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 15 gives it a more specific. So if it's all the tribes of all the earth, you are going to have kings. You're going to have great men. You're going to have rich men. You're going to have chief captains. You're going to have mighty men, free men, bond men. That's pretty much everybody. There's a whole group of people associated with the tribes of the earth being described in Revelation chapter 20, chapter 6, giving revelation to what we read in Matthew 24, giving clarity to what we read in Matthew 24. But are we missing something here? We see the day of his wrath that is come, presently has arrived, is here now. Are we missing that great gathering together? Revelation chapter 7. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. And here he goes forth, and he seals 144,000 of the tribe of Judah, of the tribe of Reuben, of the tribe of Asher, of the tribe of... And continues on, and these are all Israelite tribes that are sealed at this time. Israelite tribes who, in the context of which we are living now, I believe don't even exist. And so he's grabbing... Israelite tribes, I believe these were already dead. I believe these are already residing in heaven. I believe these are Old Testament saints that are being brought together for a particular purpose. But what I really want to grab hold of is down at the end of verse 8. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Well, that's limited, Brother Josh. That's no way reflecting of the great gathering together of the elects from one end of heaven unto the other. 144,000 clearly doesn't encapsulate that. But what about this? One end of heaven unto the other. Remember, grab a hold of that. And after this, verse 9, I beheld in lo a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sits upon the throne and unto the land. A very different cry than what the men, the chief captains, those that are of every tribe of the people upon earth are crying out when they say the great day of his wrath is come. These are crying out salvation to our God which sitteth upon his throne. Verse 11, And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto you, our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, speaking unto the Apostle John, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Who are these, and where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall sunlight on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. What a beautiful sight. But grab a hold of what happened in that exchange. Who are these and where did they come from? A great multitude which no man can number. The question was asked 
unto the apostle, and he said, Lord, he said, Sir, thou knowest. And the response was these, which came out of great tribulation. That same great tribulation is referred to in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. It says, When then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, nor ever shall be immediately after the tribulation and before what we have here is God's wrath about to be poured out in chapter 8 where it says, Whoa, whoa, whoa unto them as the seven angels come and seven trumpets are blown and there's golden censers given unto them and the smoke comes out and all of these events happen as the angel pours out his hail and fire and blood and all these things are cast on there's very supernatural events happening at this point there's trumpets being sounded which is doo -doo -doo -doo, and something happens this isn't the same as the as the unsealing right this is not the same event as the unsealing of things that were just waiting in the wind this is a completely different a completely special and unique case and it's referred to not only in revelation chapter um, chapter 24 it's also referred to in revelation chapter 6 when the men cry out and say great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand in matthew chapter 24 and verse 25 he said the statement behold i have told you before and the very particular reason why he told us before is so that we could see these things coming to pass and we would not be shocked when these things coming are coming to pass he begins to explain by parable, Matthew 24 and verse 32. He says, Learn a parable of a fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Here that parable is very specifically just giving you the idea that it was told in verse 25. Behold, I have told you before. He says, learn the parable. When the branch is tender and the leaves shoot forth, you know it is summer. Even so, when you shall see these things come to pass, you know that it is near. Well, what is near? Go back to the beginning of, first, of chapter 24. What shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The specific things that he has given is the specific things that are coming to pass when you see these events come before you. And it was all to the end, as it says in verse 24. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in which in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Well, there it is. Watch, because you don't know what hour the Son of Man cometh. There's going to be where you say, well, you know not the day and the hour, and therefore Jesus can come at any moment. But know the truth of this whole scripture in the context, which is the way we believe and interpret scripture, is that you may not know the hour, but you know the signs. You may not know the precise moment, but you know the things that shall come to pass, that when they do come to pass, behold, I have told you before, behold, don't suffer your house to be broken up. Why? Because you know this, the good man, as a good man of the house, you will watch for the thief. You will understand the things that are coming to pass. You will watch and you will know not the hour, but the events, and therefore it will not shock you when the events do actually come to pass. So what's the charge then? What is the charge? It's to be faithful and wise. Therefore be ye also ready for in an hour that ye think not the Lord cometh. And as we are walking through the Ecclesiastes, book of Ecclesiastes, we learn the same type of mentality is given forth. Watch and know, be faithful and a wise servant. And this is what he was constantly saying. This life is vain, this life is fleeting, this life is but for a moment and it shall pass. But for now you need to be wise. But for now you need to watch. But for now you need to be a faithful and a good servant because then you'll see these things come to pass, and you'll be acting accordingly when they do. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his health for, to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord layeth coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink of the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall 
come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when the judgment of God sets in, when he arrives, when the tribulation comes, and on the heels of it, the sun and moon being darkened, on the heels of it, the great signs and wonders in heaven, on the heels of it, Jesus Christ coming, sending his angels with the sound of a trumpet, gathering together from the four winds. If somebody is that evil servant who is not doing so, who has not studied, who has not understood these things, who has not heard these things before, they will have, no doubt, the salvation that comes. They will be resurrected, no doubt, in the same way as any other believer, but shall be cut asunder, and his portion shall be with the hypocrites. What this is simply describing is, hey, if you're in God's will, great exploits are awaiting you. The Bible describes in the book of Daniel that those that know him will do great exploits. In other words, there's an opportunity for those that are in the know and understand the tribulation time that is coming. There is the opportunity for them to do great exploits, but the opposite is true for those that don't recognize, have not heard their Lord's rules, have not followed his instructions, have not heeded the word that is presented before him. And when the Lord of that servant comes, they were not aware of it, and he shall cut them asunder and appoint them to the portion of the hypocrites. There's, there's just as embarrassing of a fall as to the unbelievers to this one. The Bible says in verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, and not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. For as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And the truth about the days of Noah was that not everybody was lost. Not everybody was an unbeliever, but they acted as if they were. And when they were marrying and giving a marriage and just doing business as usual, they did not know until the floods came the things that shall come to pass. They didn't heed like verse 25, behold, I have told you before. They had not heard before. They didn't regard the preaching of, that was going forth from Noah. And therefore, they had the same portion with the unbelievers as is described in verse 51. And this is this. Verse 40, Then shall be two in the field, the one shall be taken, the other one left. Two men shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. There is a general overarching consistency with how life is being lived, and the one that is living amongst the one grinder and the one that is, like the two grinders together, were both doing the same things. One was taken, and the other one was left. One did not know to do anything different than the one they were standing beside. But I like how that actually describes, it goes back to what we were originally reading in the book of Ecclesiastes. Because you see these exact signs given, and I believe it was to set the same stage for what the preacher is explaining, and that's living righteously in this present life, taking advantage of every opportunity, though we're living here vainly, and he brings in the same types of examples. And it's amazing to me when I found that. Sun and moon being darkened there. You find that in, uh, in the end of Ecclesiastes there. You find strong men bowing themselves together. It's the men that hid in the dens and in the rocks of the earth, crying to them, fall upon us. And then you find this that we just read. Grinders ceasing because they are few. 50% of them are gone and the others are there. The grinding is ceasing. There, there's, a, there's something happening. There's something changing here. And Solomon in his wisdom way back then started to see these things come to pass. And as you read through the Old Testament scriptures, they're going to have light shed on them by the New Testament. This is why it's so important for us to take and compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Compare truths in the New Testament to truths in the Old Testament and bring them together to get a full understanding of what's going on. And here he's saying there's an end to all these things in Ecclesiastes. There is a culmination of all things. Verse 80 says, Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. All is vanities, but he doesn't just leave it there. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. He understood the vainness of this life, but he still taught the people knowledge. What kind of knowledge do you think he would teach? Well, the very ways of this earth, the very scriptures that we just discovered, the very things that are warning people of things which are to come. Behold, I have told you before, because he was wise, he told these things. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words that would end 
that which was written was upright and words of truth. The words of the wise are as goats and as nails fastened by the master of the assemblies and are given by one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making of many books, there is no end and of much study is a weariness of the flesh. And all this brings him to the conclusion of the whole matter. And all that I have talked to you about living life and godliness and all that I have expounded unto you about how to live in this present evil world, which has an end that is coming, which is going to be foreseen by great tribulation upon the saints, even as foreshadowed by Solomon here. With all that's to come, we need to focus on what we're doing right now. And what we're doing right now needs to involve the core teachings of what we've had. Giving, maintaining our testimony, living life to the fullest, being wise, doing all of these things that he's taught about and all these things, but he's going to conclude it and he's just going to give it as if, if he just had a moment of time in which he could expound unto his son one particular truth that would overarch, overbear, that would circumvent, that would explain everything that he wants to say to his son in a nutshell would be in verse 13. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And if we fear God and keep his commandments, even as Christ gave us two opportunities whereby we could hang all the law, and that's the love of the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love thy neighbor as yourself, even here, the Solomon in the Old Testament gives a same law on which to hang all of them. Hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with the secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So you may think that you have secret th sins. You may have sins in your heart and in your mind that you don't want others to know about. God shall bring those same into judgment, whether they be good or whether they be evil. You will have a day of reckoning for your acts upon this earth, whether you're saved or whether you're lost. Praise be to God that we won't be held accountable for our sins, for all our sins were nailed unto the tree if we're believed by faith. All of our sins have been carried far, far away by the Lord Jesus Christ. But still, the duty of everyone who's ever and will ever abide on this earth, though there is an end to it all, and all of it is ultimately vain and vexation of spirit, the ultimate duty of all of us is to fear God and keep his commandments. That is our duty. That is our responsibility. And that is the whole of the Ecclesiastes book in a nutshell. And I just love how he took the sun and moon and the stars being darkened. He took men struggling, strong men bowing themselves. He talked about the streets being shut. He talked about the sounds of grinding low because the grinders have been removed. He said all men are going to the dust. He brings in apocalyptic end times pictures to bring it into the context of, hey, this is all final, and this is the end judgment of all men that is to come, to tell his son, to convince his son, to encourage his son. 2 verse 13, fear God and keep his commandments. It's vain what else you're trying to do. Just do this. Fear God and keep his commandments. All of your works, all of your deeds, all of your doings are vain if you're not fearing God and keeping his commandments. That's your duty. That's your responsibility 